there are a lot of new folks here, um, and so I want to introduce myself to you. I'm Mark Tips. I'm the athletic director here. I also teach American government and economics. I teach uh, coach seventh grade football and varsity baseball. I'm beginning my seventh year at MBA. Before I got here six years ago, I spent 30 years practicing law in Nashville and was involved in politics for several years in Washington. Um, Brad asked me to talk today about excellence. I want to make sure you understand what I'm referring to. I'm not talking to you about your lives. I'm talking today about what we can do here institutionally to inspire our boys to pursue excellence in everything they do and to seek to live extraordinary lives, lives that make a difference in other people's lives. So that's my focus today. Why is that important to me? Because as you get older, you start reflecting on life. You start looking backwards. You realize you have a whole lot less runway in front of you than you have behind you. And you begin to try to distill down the things that are important in life because you want to pass those on to your kids, to your friends, in my case, my students and the kids I coach. So you think about a lot of things. And as I think about my experiences in life and what's important, several issues come to mind. One is effort. There are a lot of things that go into making a person successful. But if I think about the people that I rubbed, rubbed elbows with, worked with, represented, who I think lived exceptional lives, who strive for excellence, they all gave effort. Yeah, they may have had other factors too, but they worked really hard. They were intentional about their life. And that is a trait that is enduring and abiding. And it is what separates people from success and, and failure. And it is what keeps a person living an extraordinary life, an important life, a life of meaning versus a life of mediocrity. I think it's a really important concept. It's one we do not talk enough about. Individuals do, but institutionally, I don't think we do. It's something Brad and I have talked about for the last couple of years, and he's told me he wants to work on this with me. It's important to him, too. Two years ago today, my dad passed away. He was uh, three weeks shy of his 97th birthday. He uh, grew up in Deckard, Tennessee, if you know where that is, in Franklin County. Was a product of the Depression, joined the Army at 17, and then spent 10 months in combat in the uh, European theater with General Patton's Third Army. In his final weeks, I had lots of opportunities to be with him and talk to him. And in those discussions, I asked him one time, you know, you've lived almost 97 years. Do you regret anything? Is there anything you would do over again? Anything major, not little things? He said, no. I have no regrets. None. God has been good. He got me through a war. I have been the best father I can be. I've raised three great boys. Two are surgeons, one's a lawyer, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> you always used to say that. <clears throat> Married to the same woman for 78 years. I don't regret anything. And I've thought about that conversation a ton. How do you do that? How do you live a life without regret? If I went today, I would have some things I regret. So. I think trying to live a life without regret, a major regret, is an important concept. And I think one of the things that I saw my dad do, there were many factors, that'd be a whole separate speech. There are many factors that I think led him to that. And one was everything he did, he gave his absolute best. He always worked hard. If it was worth doing, it was worth doing right. And so it makes me think, why is there so much mediocrity in our world? Why are we surrounded by it? 
Some people can't help it. They're born into situations they simply cannot get out of. I understand that. But a lot of people, that's not the case. They don't choose to live mediocre lives. People don't go to a board and say, let's see, good life, extraordinary life, mediocre. Oh, I'm going to choose mediocre. They don't. It chooses them. It's a screensaver. It's a default mechanism. It's what happens when you don't choose to live intentionally every day with something important in mind and with specificity in your goals and in your life. It's what takes over. So you may say, well, why are we talking about this at MBA? Look around us. Wow, we're in the Dead Poets Society room. We have this phenomenal campus, and all of our boys are like the kids at Lake Wobegon, right? They're all above average. I'm going to suggest to you that that may not be true. I think becoming and being a parent, you heard Jamie talk a little while ago, I think being a parent is much more difficult today than it was in my dad's era. And I watch a lot of our parents struggle being parents. Some of them need parenting. And to the extent we believe that all of these boys are being inspired at home, that is not the case. Their parents need to be inspired. They are certainly not doing the inspiring. For many of our boys, absolutely, that is the case. But there's a significant number for whom that is simply not the case. And I think that it is important that we think institutionally about how to raise this notion of living an extraordinary life and pursuing excellence. I want to tell you what's really brought this to a head for me. I teach American government and economics, one class, one class. American government in the fall, econ spring. Since I started, I have always incorporated a day every week or two particularly in the spring when we get to know each other really well, where I just sit down in a chair and I put them down in a semicircle around me and I say, let's talk about life. Anything you want to talk about. And as we get to know each other and all the bravado and BS comes out of them, they start talking about everything. And you can ask Ms. Dreyer because she has joined that several times to, to give a perspective of somebody younger and from a female standpoint, and she will tell you there is not much that they don't talk about, particularly as we get to the spring. Late in the spring, I asked them this question. Guys, if you had it to do over again, by the way, my class is almost all seniors, and it's not an AP class. If you had it to do over again, would you come back to MBA? And if you would, would you do anything differently? This is the answer that I have gotten every year from well over half of my class. After the BS and the bravado is gone, they crack a few jokes, this is what I get. Yeah, I'd come back, love MBA. I guess what I regret is that I didn't try as hard as I could have. I regret that I didn't study harder in ninth and 10th grade. I didn't realize how important that was going to be later on, how limiting it was going to be in my choices for college. And now I'm going to the University of Blank, and that's going to be fine. It's not my first choice, but, you know, it's where I am. It'll be okay. That devastates me. I don't like hearing 18-year-olds already living with regret. And it has led me to have conversations with Brad about what can we do institutionally to raise the specter of effort, giving effort, working hard every day, trying to live an extraordinary life. It's not an easy thing. I'll tell you in a minute what I tell those kids, by the way, when they say that. What does it even mean to live an extraordinary life or to pursue excellence? Well, that's up for debate. Warren Buffett has lived an extraordinary life. He's worth billions. So did Mother Teresa. She did it according to a vow of poverty, so it's not about money. If you listened yesterday, George Mario lived in, has lived an extraordinary life, right? He's pursued excellence. Think of the guts that took. Could any of us do that? Who else 
Jamie Tillman, sitting right over here, has lived an extraordinary life. Not many people outside NBA know him. He's not wealthy, although he's got a lot more money than he'd ever tell you he does. <laughs> if you ever need to borrow money, go see Jamie. <laughs> Sorry, bub. But he gets up every day, and he lives intentionally. If you've told him something about you that's bothering you, he will check on you a day or two later. He has impacted hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. So what it means is different from everybody. I can't give you a particular definition. I can tell you the best synopsis of what I think it takes to get there is in the book Grit. Brad's talked about that book a lot, written by Angela Duckworth. I'm embarrassed to say that I was up in Philadelphia with John getting his apartment ready for him to start. He, yesterday was the first day of med school at Penn. We're in the bookstore and I'm looking around and there's a section, books by Penn faculty, and there's Grit. Somebody had given it to me as a present, a parent, a year or two ago. It sat on my desk. I never read it. Amanda came and said, can I read it since you're obviously not going to? And I said, sure. And she did. And she came back and said, you need to read this. And I didn't. So when I saw it that day, I realized I probably need to look at that. There's a reason that I've seen that. And I didn't know she was a Penn faculty. She's a professor of psychology. So I skimmed through that book quite a bit over the last month. And I love what she says. She says the best predictors of success in the future are not your IQ, they're not your looks, they're not your talent, they're not your race, they're not your wealth. They are what she coins grit, passion, perseverance, persistence, endurance with respect to long-term goals. And I love what she says as well. Based on her research, the brain is a malleable thing. It can change. Failure is not permanent. That kid who's, quote, not a good student can become a good student. The brain can change. Now, I'm not talking about elitism when I talk about excellence. Not, I'm not saying every kid can and should go to an Ivy League school or a little Ivy or even a top 50, but I am saying every kid can and should give 100% effort. And I reject the notion that I get from a lot of parents. Amanda and I meet with these parents. They come in and want to talk about their kid playing college sports. Kid's gone off to the bathroom. Mama walks in. Hey, Coach Tips, thanks so much for meeting with us. Listen, before Johnny gets here, let me just tell you, he's a B student. Now, mind you, he's a sophomore. He's a B student. He might make an A occasion, but he's going to make mainly Bs and Cs, and that's all he can do. So we should think about schools where that might be something he can do, where he could get in. Johnny comes in the door, sit him down. I say, Johnny, look at me right here. I don't want any BS. I want you to tell me the truth. Are you busting your ass in the classroom as hard as you busted on the football field? The answer is always the same. No, sir. I look at the parents. Quit trying to be his best friend and be his parent. Maybe he won't be a straight A student, but he for God sure won't be if he doesn't give all the effort that he has. How do you do it? That's a whole nother speech. I will tell you some common traits of people that I have rubbed shoulders with and come into contact with in 30 years of law practice and politics people who I think have lived extraordinary lives and who have pursued excellence in one way or another. They live intentionally, they pay attention to detail. They are disciplined. They understand the concept of delayed gratification. That is not something our kids understand. They take that phone out and they look at it every time they have an urge to. Put the phone away, get your work done. It's a simple concept, parents don't enforce it. If there are two paths to take, these people tend to take the tougher path, not the easier one. And they do not run with the crowd. Mediocrity is like misery. It loves company. Why are you running those wind sprints so hard? Dude, you're making us look bad. Why are you getting to work so early? You're making us look bad. Why are you staying so late? You're making us look bad. Mediocrity loves company. They don't run with the crowd. 
Do we do this here individually? Yes. And I'll give you an example. When I was up in Philly, I told John I was going to be talking about this issue. He said, God, for God's sake, don't talk about me. So if you see him, tell him I did not talk about him, okay? <laughs> I said, well, you know, let me ask you a question. You, you're getting ready to go to a pretty good med school here. Uh, what, anything ever happened at MBA that inspired you? I don't mean the courses you took, but did anybody inspire you to reach high and to excel? He said, absolutely, Dr. Dickens. Where is he? Yeah. He was my advisor. We had an incredible advisor. We had Adam Bowman in there. We had all these kids that were so brilliant. Dr. Dickens said, we can all be like that. All you got to do is work really hard and not be like everybody else around you. And I believed him. So we do it uh, individually. I'll close by this. What can we do institutionally? That is the question that I want to pose to you. What can we do institutionally to begin to raise this concept? to make busting your hump cool. Kids will do it on the sports field. Not cool for a lot of them to do it in the classroom, but it is important to them. It needs to be done. It is an important value in life. I'm gonna end by telling you how I answer that question. When the kid says to me, I regret not giving my all. I regret not working hard. I wish I had studied as a ninth and 10th grader. I'm not going where I really want to go, but life will be okay. This is what I say to him. Life is short. You will blink and be 30. You will blink and be 55. God puts you here to help other people and to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Figure it out. If you want to be somebody different when you go to college, you can be on day one. Start living life intentionally. Pay attention to detail. Go to class, take notes, listen to the professor, do the reading. On Sundays, write down everything you have due this next week and mark it off as you do it. Set extraordinarily, outrageously high goals for yourself. And do not run with the crowd. If you will do those things on day one, you can be anybody you want to be, and what you've done these past three or four years will not matter. What I would love is to not have to give that speech to those boys. I would love to be able to say, just keep doing what you've been doing. Keep working as hard as you've been working. I'm proud of you. And what I would love from you all is your thoughts on how we might do that institutionally at this school. Thanks for your attention.